Terry Hyde with Your Pets Life Coach. I'm super excited to be here tonight um, because we have one of our fabulous, fabulous vets that we just adore and love talking to. She was talking about my big wing chair, my big uh, tiger stripe, I guess, wing chair. Um, so it. before it went live. But anyway, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. I want to introduce you guys to uh, one, of, one of my favorite vets. I, I'd love to just call her a friend of mine. I can't wait to get out to Florida, which is where she is. But you tonight we're going to be... My we're gonna I want to so bad. You, you know I want to. be my friend. Because you constantly are posting pictures of my dream, like the, the <laughs> farm and the horses and the, the life I'm, I was definitely supposed to be living in. Um, someday, someday. But tonight, I want to introduce you guys to uh, Dr. Robin Canazero. She is a holistic, homeopathic, passionate, passionate veterinarian who are hard to find, you know, because sometimes I always say this, um, she's, she's the triple threat. Because so many vets um, lose their passion, it gets really, it kind of weighs on you. But tonight we're going to be speaking with Dr. Canazero. Dr. Canazero, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's just, it's always a pleasure to do, uh, to do these shows with you. I really enjoy it. So I hope we have a lot of wonderful questions. And um, so people, please don't be shy. Because um, Carrie and I are always game to answer any questions that we can for you. Yeah, don't be shy. I said, I said to Dr. Canazero, we now, I used to stream this straight through the spa, which was a lot of my clients uh, on the East Coast and some people that would follow us. But now we stream it through a Facebook group called Saving Pets One Pet at a Time. So a lot of times you'll hear me kind of referring to both. Um, one thing I want to make sure I stress, because this has happened in the past, and I wish I could take a screenshot and I was better at this, but sometimes some of the moderators on saving pets one pet at a time we have 27 moderators admins we have uh, people involved in that that are helping you and sometimes you guys come on but on my screen it doesn't tell me who you are it just says facebook user so if there are any of the admins or moderators from saving pets one pet, pet at a time and you're talking can you just say hey it's sonia hey it's brian because last week brian came on um and so we had all these people on there that i would have loved to have kind of introduced as well. Dr. Canazero doesn't know everybody either, um, but we all work together to try to help you. And then we bring on these fabulous people like Dr. Canazero to help us. So um, make sure if you're on there, you type out your name because for whatever reason, I only see Facebook users. So yeah, that's all I'm seeing as well. Isn't it? That's, that's some new thing, I think. I don't know. It never used to be like that. And now all I see is Facebook user. Wow. Yep. Um, Anyway, so I just want you guys to know the difference between a homeopathic veterinarian and a holistic veterinarian, they are different. So I always tell people this, um, you can't have, you, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Karen Azero, you can't have a homeopathic veterinarian that isn't holistic, but you can have a holistic veterinarian that isn't homeopathic. Is that right? Um, that's correct. But holistic medicine is an umbrella term. So right. a holistic medicine encompasses all forms of natural medicine treatment. And um, however, there are much fewer homeopathic veterinarians than there are holistic vets. And a holistic veterinarian might be doing a combination of a variety of things. They might be doing acupuncture, they might be doing uh, chiropractic, better, better known, or we're supposed to say spinal adjustment. Um, they might be doing herbs, Ayurvedic medicine. Um, they might be doing American herbal therapies, massage therapy, Reiki, um, when you take holistic as a term and Carrie and I carry on about calling, uh, a lot of the veterinarians out there folistic, um, because they're not really holistic. What some of them are doing are adding some holistic modalities to their allopathic, uh, traditional medicine practice. And that's a very, very different thing. You're really going to an allopathic veterinarian that is offering some holistic modalities. And it doesn't make them bad veterinarians. They're not, you know, uh, terrible vets to go to. The good news is you might be able to get some holistic modalities, but it'll be usually mixed with allopathic medicine, which I say is like driving with the brakes on. And so I don't mean to make fun of my colleagues, but if you are trained in traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, why would you abandon that or add antibiotics along with your Chinese medicine and acupuncture does that mean you have no faith in your abilities as a uh, acupuncture veterinarian and as a Chinese herbal veterinary doctor? Um, or, you know, what is it? You know, why would you use those things if you don't have faith in those medicines? Why would you even add those? 
So a homeopathic veterinarian is going to focus primarily on homeopathic um, treatment, which is medicines that are uh, severely diluted um, and shaken very precisely. And the more dilute that medicine is, uh, the more potent it is, which is completely opposite of allopathic medicine drugs. And a homeopath is going to do a detailed intake and ask detailed questions that your allopathic veterinarian will rarely ever ask, and even in more depth than the Chinese medicine workup. So um, that's an introduction of a little bit of a distinction. A homeopathic veterinarian is going to be the most holistic veterinarian usually that you'll encounter. Um, and the Chinese medicine veterinarians may or may not be, it depends if they're entangled in an allopathic practice. You know what I love um, that I learned from you, what, and you and Dr. Pekarin have been my biggest teachers in this, um, is you can't, you're not going to do harm with homeopathic. Like I hear Correct. that a lot, like you can't, you're not going to harm anything by doing this. And Correct. so that to me is, is such a, it, it really takes a lot of the pressure off of you when you're trying to to go that route because I think that's what happens with holistic veterinarians when they when they reach out to doing like you say a couple of modalities driving with the brakes on is such an amazing I say that about losing weight God I wish I could eat a, a Big Mac and go on the treadmill and cancel each other out <laughs> Gosh, that, wouldn't that be great? It would just be yeah. so great. I say it all the time. I'm like, but it's the same thing. Like it driving with the brakes on, like you can't, you, you're not, it's not going to work if you're, if you're doing well, one. You know, it's like smoking and then going into the health food store and spending $300 in supplements. I'm not going to say that that's terrible for you, but you know, right. what is the point? If you're going to smoke, you're going to undo right. uh, extensively everything you're trying to accomplish by buying um, supplements in a health food store or, you know, uh, working with a homeopathic practitioner. I mean, I'm not here to tell people how they have to live their lives, but there are definitely going to be certain barriers to the ability to be, to heal, at least from a homeopathic perspective. Um, especially if people are feeding garbage foods and kibble diets and, you know, doing homeopathy, I'm not going to say it absolutely doesn't work, but it's a barrier to progress, sort of like continuing to smoke cigarettes. Right, right. And I had a new patient in today that um, who's a adorable little Pomeranian um, presented for a history of seizures, recent onset of seizures. And, you know, she's only like turning six years old this year. And, um, and you know, she said, but I've only used the flea and tick medications, which I call flea and tick poisons. I've only used that just periodically. And I said, well, we can't ever use it again because it's going to increase the probability of seizures because of the nature of that drug and the disease the drug causes itself, which is the polite word for side effects, by the way, in case anybody was wondering. So side effects are the disease the drug causes itself uh, potentially in patients. And it's just a polite way to put it because side effects sound so much nicer. Homeopathic medicine is specific to the patient. So we do a workup because not every patient that has itchy or ears or ear problems, or they're not all going to get the same homeopathic medicine. It entirely depends on every aspect of their personality, of their behavior, of their physical uh, maladies, what leads up to these things, what things they're sensitive to, um, what makes it better, what makes it worse is going to help us to determine what homeopathic medicine to choose that is specific to your pet. So uh, the first appointment is usually lengthier because I go through all the medical records and I also do a detailed workup from the first time you ever got your baby until the, present, the presentation at my office and what are the key events that led to any symptoms that arose over a given period of time. And if I can find causality and causations, that's helpful. But Dr. Pitcarn is absolutely correct. Homeopathy can cause no harm. Um, and in my experience, and I've been, uh, I've been using homeopathic medicine and doing workups um, since the uh, early to mid 90s, my experience has been the most powerful and deepest healing modality that exists. I'm not pushing off, I'm a trained uh, veterinary acupuncture traditional Chinese medicine vet as well. And I use that um, on occasion in my practice, not nearly as often as homeopathy. 
Um, so I'm not saying that any of these other modalities have no use whatsoever. And I do a lot of um, adjusting in my office because that doesn't interfere with homeopathy. Some of the other powerful healing modalities that move energy like acupuncture and Chinese herbs can not always, but sometimes interfere with homeopathic treatment. So I'm cautious uh, using that. Uh, sometimes I'll pick and choose my cases carefully, which ones might get acupuncture and Chinese herbs, uh, which ones may not, or if there's a chance I might use Chinese herbs in a particular patient or case. Most of the time I choose to mix the modalities if I do, if I have late stage disease, end stage disease, really approaching the comfort level of the patient, which is foremost in my mind. Um, and I may feel that I need something more. I know not all homeopathic veterinarians are going to agree with me, but it's rare, if ever, that the something more is going to be a drug, a pharmaceutical, um, a vaccination, a surgery, or anything like that. My, I just saw a post, uh, I think it was today or tomorrow, but my, my brain isn't, it well, doesn't matter. I just saw a post and it was a picture of a dog who had been on, I don't remember who posted it, dang it, um, three years of working with an allopathic veterinarian, and it was the pictures of this dog, and he was just in bad shape. Maybe somebody can help me out. They probably saw it. We all kind of seem to be in the same spots. But, and then it was three months with home homeopathy. So it was three years, and this dog was just skinny. It's skin. It was just a hot mess. And then three months of homeopathy. And the difference was night and day. I mean, night and day. And it was three months with homeopathy. So, um, you know, you see stuff like that and you're just kind of like, whoa. But to your point, Dr. Canizero, it's scary because we don't know. And most of you know, I did a podcast. And if you don't, I did a podcast with Dr. Richard Picarin a while back who really, we got, we were able to get really deep into the understanding. And I remember telling him that I was always afraid of it because I thought it had something to do with math and I want you to explain this a little bit because, well, because it was all, you know, three X and two X and five X. And I was like, no, 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 no. That, was that darn decimal stuff that was killing you. Right. Yeah. And, it, uh, it, 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 it just scared me. And I thought I'll never be able to figure that out. And especially because you talk, you know, you think that the more potent it is, the stronger it is, right? And it's actually the opposite. So I, I'm not, in no way am I here to t teach people. I don't touch homeopathy because it just- Well, I'll just scare you a little bit more because um, basically the idea, the, the whole concept of how homeopathic medicine works because it's an energy medicine, once we get to a 30C, 100C, 200C potency, you have no measurable substance in that pellet or that liquid preparation whatsoever. It's completely an energy medicine. So if you did any kind of measurement to look for arsenic or mercury or anything like that, which whatever the remedy is made from, you can't find any of it in there. And um, I know that's a difficult concept, but just to blow your mind more, you don't even have to worry about math. Then we're getting into physics. So Homeopathic medicine is based more on physics. Allopathic medicine is based more on biology. And it's not that biology has no validity at all, but biology sort of explains how things operate and how things work, but it doesn't tell you how to fix anything or treat anything. And because we all have vibrational energies, the homeopathic medicine actually stimulates a healing response if it is exactly the right fit for the patient. It has to be the right fit and the right potency. To take the math out of the equation for you, it kind of doesn't matter if you don't understand the uh, decimal system, you know, X potencies. You can actually measure in most X potencies till you get to about a 30X, um, below a 30X, like a 6X, 9X. You can measure substance in that uh, medicine. You can actually measure it. So if it is mercurious, mer mercury, it's going to have just a, a little bit of mercury, not enough in any way to poison you. You couldn't even take that often enough to poison you because it's still too dilute to be able to do that. But it actually has some physical substance in it. And then once you get to the higher potencies that are stronger, they have no measurable substance in them. But you can do really sophisticated physics study and actually see things move in the solution. 
now you're talking about electron microscopy and things like that. So we won't get too deep into that science because then we'll blow everybody's mind. But yeah. there's actually something happening in that solution. So there is an energy, a vibration, a movement of at atoms, electrons, et cetera, in that solution that actually do something. And when we give the right medicine to the patient, it stimulates a healing response. Because all we ever want to get to is homeostasis. Homeostasis is where you're in balance, where everything's functioning optimally, that you just don't have a spillover, an explosion of a particular symptom. Right. And homeopathic medicine stimulates a healing response to attempt to restore homeostasis as close as one can get to that. Because let's face it, I see a lot of animals that come in with cancer, seizures, liver failure, heart failure. Some of these patients may be too far along in their actual structural disease. It's always better if we can get to the functional disease state, and I'll define that in a second. But once we get to structural disease where the tissues are broken down or damaged or worn out or damaged beyond repair by whatever it is usually we've done as veterinarians or you know, feeding bad diets, uh, vaccinating too much, using too much drugs, using drugs inappropriately, using them too often, too repetitively, um, not healing the underlying imbalance to bring the animal to homeostasis, we cause more damage and more harm. So then we're layering more disease upon the, you have the original disease. Then we layer drugs once a symptom erupts. We layer drugs on that and we add to that disease. So now we're adding. Uh, we're back to math again. I'm really sorry. And so you've added to the disease. And you might even morph or change the, um, the appearance of that disease and make it profoundly worse or more devastating or drive the disease more internally to a more vital area or place like resolving itchy skin with Apoquil or Cytopoint or steroids could drive the disease to cancer instead. Right. And it so does. They, they could be a direct side effect of the drug, but it also could be, it is the original disease with the layering upon it of the disease the drug brings to the table that will change and morph the disease and create a newer, bigger, badder disease. I know that's poor English, but we all understand. And if we treated a functional disease state, functional disease means and I'm sure most of your listeners have been there before and you may, you have as well. You bring your pet in, they have a symptom and the veterinarian does an entire workup and blood work and a physical exam, x-rays, whatever. And they say, well, we can't find anything wrong. So here's some medication to go home with. All the time. At that point, we could be missing the actual structural disease, but more likely you have functional disease, meaning that the body is expressing itself saying, hey, I've got something to matter. This is the symptom I'm presenting to show you what's wrong. And then we go and say, no, you can't have that symptom by using a drug to shove that symptom down. Um, and then the patient looks like they might be better, but then it either comes back again or it gets worse. And it's a snowball effect where more and more drugs are layered upon. And right. eventually that functional disease where everything was okay tissue wise, then becomes a structural disease, which is a tissue change like a tumor or an organ failure or organ damage or neurologic damage um, or uh, a severe arthritis, you know, you name it. Um, we could pick anything you would like. Um, but and then you have a structural disease. So by the time you have like itchy skin, that's probably not too much of a structural disease. But if your skin disease or allergies turn into pemphigus, lupus, um, you know, something much more severe then you're talking about more serious, deeper damage. Um, and if otherwise it's obvious, if you have heart failure, liver failure, kidney failure, uh, severe digestive disease, like inflammatory bowel disease, lymphoma, uh, or other kinds of cancers, et cetera. So I hope that distinction makes sense. We always want to catch things as a homeopath or at any time at the functional disease state. Yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. And I, I, I understand homeopathy of how it works. It's just not something that I would jump into and help people with. But before we get into these questions, I want you to just, I already know the answer to this, but they don't. Um, mm -hmm. Would you recommend somebody buying homeopathic treatments online and just doing it themselves? Not generally. I mean, Dr. Pitcairn's book, Natural Health for Dogs and Cats, does have a little algorithm. And I think um, Dr. Don Hamilton's book does as well. And then there's also some English uh, publishers that publish some books for the lay person. It's okay to use homeopathic medicines in an acute situation, like 
let's say your pet injured or hurt themselves, it wasn't particularly serious and you used Arnica, I, you're not going to cause harm. But what you will do if you're trying to treat a more uh, complicated chronic disease case, something that's repetitive, something that continues to come back again over and over again, or you have this disease and now this disease and then now this disease, it's very difficult and impractical for a person not trained in homeopathic medicine to treat that safely and effectively. You won't really cause harm, but you will delay proper intervention and you might even confuse the case. Yeah. Because I will tell you that palliation, suppression, um, any of those things can happen with improper use of homeopathic medicines. And I am so vehemently against um, the over-the-counter combination homeopathic medicines they're not homeopathic to the patient. It's like a grab bag of, of homeopathic medicines thrown in one bottle um, and like the most common remedies for urinary tract infections. And you throw all 12 of them in different potencies at the patient. They might get better, they might not. But I would argue with you that when it stops working and it will, then you have no idea where to go next homeopathically because the case hasn't been worked up homeopathically. We don't understand what in that bottle of medicine worked, if anything, or did you just suppress the urinary tract infection? I don't know. Right. So we can get conf what we call confused cases through improper use of homeopathic medicines, combination homeopathic medicines. I would rather have a patient come to me, and I bet you Dr. Pickern will say the same. I would much rather have a patient come to me that is on drugs than is on a, a grab bag of homeopathic you know, willy nilly treatment, because I can ferret through that. And I can understand the progression of that animal's disease much better than when they've been messed up with lots of throwing homeopathic medicines in not knowing what you're doing. So again, to recap, treating, you know, uh, acute conditions that are not very serious with uh, Arnica, for instance, I don't see any harm in that whatsoever. But if you have an individual, you know, animal that has chronic ear infections, chronic skin problems, behavioral issues, excuse me, UTI, chronic UTIs or, you know, organ diseases or seizures or anxiety disorders or ADHD disorders or musculoskeletal disorders. And these are things, these chronic things, and even young animals can have chronic disease. So if we want more definition about that, we can go into it. I can give you some examples of what that is. Yeah. Well, I think we should get into some questions. I just wanted to give everybody kind of a, you know, I always worry especially with homeopathy, because I know the write-up is the mo like very important is understanding because you can, I know I've learned from you so many times, you can have a, an animal with the same symptoms and have different homeopathic remedies for them based on a few other things that have to be asked. And so a lot of times, if you don't know about homeopathy, you're not asking the right questions about your own dog. So you wouldn't be able to do it. You have to really, the write-up is so important. And so as we get into these questions, I want to make sure a couple of things. One, uh, Dr. Canizero cannot like treat your pet right here, right now. <laughs> so this <laughs> that, that can't happen. Yeah. Um, these are going to be general questions. They're not for everyone. So as she's answering these questions, please don't think that because it's right for one question, it's right for your dog or your cat. Um, so we just want to be really careful and, and definitely be very responsible in how we're helping you kind of learn a little bit more about homeopathy and how it works. Um, so I'm excited. You have lots of questions. So let's just kind of start. Um, I just want to say, first and foremost, when I mispronounce these things, remember that I don't hear a lot of these because I don't work in homeopathy. I just, so I know I'm going to mispronounce and stuff. Probably number one, epimedium. What is it used for? Epimedium is a Chinese herb. So yes, it's not I a homeopathic right. medicine. Yes, you did. Absolutely. And I think I saw that question come up um, earlier. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not at the end of. I'm not at the beginning of the prescribing of that particular Chinese herb, but generally speaking, epimedium is most commonly used for what we call Jing deficiency in Chinese medicine. Every one of us and every one of your dogs is born with a certain level of Jing, and it is tied uh, really closely to kidney. And the Jing energy, when you run out of it, you're done. You're going to pass away. That's just the way it is. We can use Jing up in a variety of different ways. And again, I'm speaking Chinese medicine. This has nothing to do with homeopathy. I presume from the question that was asked that the epimedium was used because the dog had a neuter. 
it, you can't necessarily say, well, okay, well, we neutered your dog, so there, therefore epimedium is indicated any, any more than you can say I had an injury and arnica is indicated because the Chinese herbs are also prescribed specific to the patient, whatever is going on with the patient. So I would have to assume that for, well, I shouldn't assume, it could be that the prescriber thought that by neutering, they wanted to sort of pump up the jing a little bit because we can add to jing a little bit by good living, eating properly, and the right Chinese herb. Um, we're not going to give you all of your jing back, but we can help to uh, promote, uh, tonify, support, build it up a little bit. So, yeah, somebody said preserve the jing. So, yes, yeah, I see it here. Really too, so I think it's yeah, yeah, I think that's what I'm seeing too. I didn't. Well, put the thing those is, you together. can't neuter a dog and say I I, I can undo um, the damage a neuter does by giving epimedium powder or epimedium capsules or whatever it is that they're using. And it could be that this particular dog had a Jing deficiency that was perceived by the veterinarian. But then I would argue it probably wasn't a good idea to neuter that dog or to maybe to consider a vasectomy because I'm a big believer in vasectomy and ovary sparing spays. And I promote that uh, with my clients, even though I don't do surgery anymore. So uh, let's see, situation in growing. Uh, I don't I know, uh, D, I don't know that it would particularly help uh, with growing and pump him up or anything like that. If you're talking about that herb, I don't know that that's D that's talking about the herb. So the herb is only helpful if it is um, prescribed properly for the patient and it's indicated for that particular patient. That said, that herb, because it's more tonifying, is probably not going to cause any particular damage. Um, I didn't, I was trying to put it all together. Now I'm kind of reading, uh, uh, preserve the gene. You're, you're faster than I am. I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anybody when I'm talking. And I also want to point out that one of the other admins is on here. So I just want to give her a little shout out. So her name is Sherry. Um, so hi, Sherry. She um, also is on Saving Pets with me. So she's, She's so fabulous, all constantly posting answers and stuff. So um, I just want to sh shout out to her really quick because uh, it, it takes a bunch of us to to kind of keep track of everything. And yep. and lately we feel like we're constantly just finding mean people that we're trying to get them away from everybody. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it takes so much more of your time trying to make sure that yeah. people are getting the well, right. <laughs> social media is a blessing and a curse, isn't it? So I it is. It, it is, is a blessing when it occurs. Yep. So um, uh, somebody so, asked if they could get mange from their dog. Um, yeah, it depends what kind of mange. If it's sarcoptic mange, um, then yes, you absolutely could get that from your dog. But I want to really emphasize that if a dog or a cat or a kitten or a puppy gets mange, it's ostensibly an indication that that patient is weak or has chronic disease. So it's a good example of how can a young individual actually, you know, have chronic disease. I would describe that as chronic disease if they did get mange, even though you want to argue their immune system aren't as competent, et cetera. It's competent enough. They get maternal antibodies, et cetera. So um, not all puppies or kittens or, you know, children are going to get mange or lice, right? Some do, some don't. So we can tell the weakest ones, right? The ones that actually get mange. So I'm very sorry you got mange from your dog. That does indicate that you have a weakness, but I don't know if you have mange because you're talking about a rash, which sounds very itchy, like mosquito bites or hives all over. But uh, mange doesn't necessarily cause hives, but sarcoptic mange will cause tremendous itching, intense itching. So I would definitely get uh, yourself checked or tested. You may or may not have gotten it from your dog. I don't know. Um, and But I would definitely get tested and, and get proper treatment for that. Um, and then I would maybe examine your diet and uh, your your well and health care, that kind of thing, just to make sure that there isn't a good reason that you would come down with mange. Because yeah. children and the young are more susceptible. Adults, um, not so much. I'm not saying we would never get it. That's not a, you know an impossibility, but you should not. So... She says her dog, it's so interesting to me. I'm glad she's putting that up there because we know that Apoquel is an immune suppressor, right? So, so that makes, could make sense. Makes mm -hmm. total sense. It makes yeah. total sense um, yeah. that we have suppressed any the immune, immune I was, suppressed animal could definitely get any immunosuppressive types of diseases. And they could be more prone to parasites, infections, parasitic infections, bacterial yeast infections. Um, so absolutely can be the case. 
Did I'm just curious, Arlene, what breed are you talking about? And then, um, and how, how old? It's just interesting to me because I always wonder, you know, was the mange kind of there and then we gave the Apoquil and then it came out because most, most people that are on here educated, it's not like their dogs are out in air, you know what I mean? Where they would just pick up mange. Just, right. You know, like my dog lives in my home and Arlene, I, I'm sure I, I've seen. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a situation where typically we're going to see that, you know, very depressed areas, malnutrition, yeah. you know, animals that are under it's tremendous stress, high. young animals under tremendous stress where their immune system doesn't even have a shot at it. Um, yeah. because they, just, they don't have enough nutrition. They might be skinny. They're in the ghetto. Um, not, you know, pampered family pets. Right. There's something really wrong if your pet gets um, mange. Just gets it. I and just then want to man say that demodectic mange is typically not itchy unless they get a secondary bacterial infection, which again, I wouldn't use antibiotics for. And I treat all these homeopathically. Sarcoptic mange is tricky because it is transmissible to people. Um, I'm not completely averse to using uh, medication uh, because it's a public health uh, danger. Sure. Um, especially if you have elderly people who are maybe on immunosuppressive drugs or you know, somebody who might have HIV or something like that. And in humans, there's a pyrethrin cream that, um, that clears it up really quickly, but again, get a proper diagnosis. And with animals, if we can go with something topical, that's better. Um, but there are topical things that could be used like uh, lemon washes, apple cider vinegar. Uh, most manges really don't like those kinds of acidic environments. Um, yeah. they, they get very upset about that. But again, yeah. don't go treating yourself or your animals for mange. Um, make sure you seek out proper veterinary attention, either with a homeopath um, or with your local vet, whatever your preference is. But I would definitely, uh, you know, I would definitely get that looked into. Yeah, this makes sense. Rescue Terrier from Puerto Rico makes that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that was probably previous. But then this dog was put right. on Apoquil. So I doubt that the uh, sarcoptic mange was latent or qu quiescent or not, you know, I, I doubt it was present at the time in Puerto Rico, could have been, but that wasn't a good start, most likely. Um, but I think that uh, somebody else is mentioning, and I think it's good enough to mention here, uh, that their pet was confirmed with severe dust mite allergies. Um, oh, I see that one. I don't know if this is the same one. But what I want to say about allergies, because I think it's super important, and we're going to see tons and tons of this, allergies are not really a thing. Allergies are a symptom of the underlying imbalance of chronic disease. So using um, uh, the allergy injections, Apoquil, Cytopoint, steroids, antibiotics, antifungals, whatever those shampoos and all that stuff and creams and whatever, drugs, um, any of those things are never, ever, ever going to touch the underlying imbalance. Nobody should have hypersensitivity. So allergy, first of all, is not an immune deficiency problem. It's an overactive or confused overactive immune system. So using immune supplements are not particularly helpful. Um, if you have immune modulators, that might be one thing. That's where it tries to modulate the immune system and sort of either ramp it up or settle it down. But again, supplements are absolutely not going to cure the underlying imbalance of chronic disease. Homeopathic medicine can. And I, as of the past several years, I've actually read some uh, allopathic papers that have, have admitted, dermatologists admit that they cannot cure allergies in animals. I don't know if you, your vet is telling you this or not, but they absolutely can't. Well, this um, is so what I love. This is what I, sorry, I mean. Absolutely can. I, can't I didn't want to cut you off. But I, I am so excited that you said that because that's the difference between a homeopathic, truly holistic veterinarian and an allopathic veterinarian is that if you go in with a, a allopathic veterinarian and they say your dog has allergies and then you ask why, they say, well, probably because of the pollen, probably because of this, probably because of that. But if you ask Dr. Canazero or anyone deeper into it will say, we need to look at what is causing your dog to ha not be able to respond properly to things that they're breathing in the air. We're it's never going to get rid of dust mites. We're deeper, never going right. to get rid of grasses. And um, maybe you could, and even if you moderate your diet and say, okay, I found out my pet was allergic to corn. I'm going to avoid corn forever. Right. Just think about it if you were allergic to strawberries. You know how some people are allergic to shellfish or whatever, and they could have right. an anaphylactic reaction, choke up, not be able to breathe, turn blue, and die. Right. That's pretty serious, right? 
that's an underlying imbalance of chronic disease. It's okay to avoid shellfish or strawberries if you have that yeah. violent reaction. That's an okay temporary measure. But if we don't treat the underlying imbalance, you'll either become allergic to more things or you better hope that there's not even a sprig of shellfish or anything in any supplement and any anything. Imagine living like that. And your pet doesn't have to live like that. We have to get in there and bring the pet back to homeostasis so they don't overreact to normal dietary things. Or, um, And I want to say one more thing about allergy testing because I think it's super important. I don't mind if you do allergy testing, but again, avoiding all of these things, some is impossible, like the environmental things, right? Um, maybe you can throw out all the wool in your house if you want to. Okay, if they're allergic to wool. But again, you didn't fix the underlying imbalance. We didn't bring them back to homeostasis. I also want to make you aware, and I challenge all of those companies that do allergy testing, especially for foods, especially for foods. When they're testing things like eggs and corn and uh, soy and et cetera, you name it, peanuts, whatever it is they're testing, I would like to know. If your pet tests positive for any of those items, is it the pesticides on the peanuts or is it the GMO in the soy or is it the GMO uh, that's um, genetically modified organisms or glyphosate is the most common one right. or is it GMOs in your corn or your soy um, or did they test organic corn or soy? Because maybe it's not about the food. Maybe it's about what's in that food or sure. what has damaged in that food. And that's uh, what's been sprayed on that food that your pet is reacting to. And maybe not that food at all. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people will say, well, my pet tested really positive for corn, but I, I was using this food and actually had some corn in it and my pet was doing okay. Um, so maybe that corn wasn't entire, maybe it was organic or wasn't sprayed with as much glyphosate or, or what, and that's Roundup too, by the way, just yeah. in case you're not sure where that came from. Sing it, John, sing it. Yes, yeah. yeah. right on. Glyphosate is such a problem. It is. Uh, so glyphosate is killing us in the planet. And if you don't think so, then you watch how sick your animals are getting and how sick people are getting. I know. Um, and how That's obese funny. they are and how metabolically damaged people are. Um, yeah. If you just want to have any clue where we're going with glyphosate, it is such a killer for the gut biome. It's an incredible killer for the butt guy, the gut biome. Well, and that's incredibly important because that's where a, a large part of our immune system is. So I, I run allergy tests for clients at work a lot mm -hmm. um, as a guide to try to help us get some relief for the animal. Like you're saying, if the test is coming up wool, then let's, that's an easy fix. Let's try to do that while we work on other things. Um, but I will tell you, I get a lot of clients that will come back with um, a meat source that is on there. And then I will switch them on to a absolute hormone free of that same meat source. And we don't, and the dog is fine. So right. I always tell people don't panic when you get those foods back, don't panic and go, well, he's allergic to everything. Right. I just, I start people off with the levels that are the highest. Like if it says level three, then we kind of just say, okay, we're not going to feed any of the level threes, sure. but I'll feed a level one in a hormone free, really, really pure meat. And I get wonderful results from it. So, but to well, your point, I, I propose not addressing the cause. I believe that most of the strong positives are not likely the food source itself. Right. It has more to do with the damage to the food source of the glyphosate present or um, other pesticides present. Um, yeah. And I, I'm almost certain that I'm going to be accurate on that. And, and I have the same thing where people will switch to an organic meat source or, you know, organic grain source of some kind yeah. and they don't have any trouble with it. Yeah, I don't mind staying away from the grade threes. Um, but at some point, if I feel the patient through homeopathic treatment is gaining a lot of ground and doing really well, we'll start to broaden the menu more and say, OK, we're going to try to add. I might not go for the number, you know, grade threes, the ones that they were hot positive for, which may be reality and may not be. Um, and then slowly incorporate more and more foods while they are healing uh, with homeopathic treatment. Right. I don't think the diet alone is going to do it in most cases. It used to be the case. I would say in the early in the early to mid 90s when I was practicing, um, there was a ton of things that uh, whole food diets fixed. And we just didn't necessarily have to do homeopathic treatment. 
now I almost find a case I can't get away without homeopathic treatment because they just can't get well on diet alone. Or yeah, it's, it or, really, or you're whatever. not, it, it, because we, we both have been doing this a really, really, really long time. We've, we see that this, right. That this, that this, that this, um, and I think you were absolutely right. I used to be able to put all I had to do. That's all I had to do is go get people to understand if I put you on a species appropriate diet and that was it. And the dogs were just amazing and now we've destroyed them so much and there's so much more toxic stuff that they're being born just just a hot mess they're just a hot mess and i tell my clients all the time it's not your it's this is happening way before you ever even looked at his cute little picture online and thought that's who you want to adopt (laughs) like this has nothing really to do with pet parents and they they take on so much guilt right um and, and, and it, really, it really shouldn't. I mean, so what we end up doing with um, with the young animals, unfortunately, is first of all, where chronic diseases can come from in infants or small puppies and dogs and things like that, pup, you know, kittens, etc., is that um, all of the damage we do in the parents can get concentrated down into the young. And they may not manifest the same chronic disease symptoms as the parents do. They can inherit vaccine damage. They can inherit all the damages and ravages the drugs were given. And that can be passed on down. So when we talk about inherited diseases, this is a little bit different, but it's along the same pathway. And so I argue with my colleagues because they want to only talk about inherited diseases. Um, But we have more than inherited diseases. We have a concentrated chronic disease in the young um, that occurs from breeding, even champions and the Westminster winners. And if they have chronic disease and they breed, they're going to produce puppies that produce chron- that are chronic disease. And that's going to show up at any age, maybe really young, maybe not. Um, I have a, a young French bulldog, we'll say hello to Blossom, um, who was born with a congenital heart defect. And um, she is a tiny little type. So we know that because she's so tiny, she loves her mommy. Because she's so tiny, um, she probably has more limited jing. And um, we talked about that before, right? Um, So she probably is going to have limited kidney jing. I haven't put her on Chinese herbs yet. I may or I may not. But right now she's had some homeopathic medicine and better diet because she was just on kibble diet when she came to me. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to reverse the congenital heart defects that she has. But if we can bring her to the closest state of homeostasis that we can... Um, then we can work with those uh, defects and help them live a better quality of life for as long as that's going to be. I'm not a god. I'm not a goddess. I can't make things happen. But what I can do is use my knowledge and my training in homeopathic medicine to try to maximize the ability for a patient, no matter what state they come come to me with, to try to help them live the best life they can for what they have left. Or if we start as young dogs, puppies, and kittens, we can get off to a much better start. There aren't any hard guarantees, but I can tell you in general that most of these individuals do better and live longer um, than they otherwise would. You know what else I like about homeopathy um, is that like with supplements, which I, I people know, I, like supplements have their place, but I get really frustrated when I see animals coming to me on 5,000 different supplements. And I, I, ugh, I, I cringe a lot because I'm like, and, and then I feel bad because I think people get frustrated with me because I'm like, nope, nope, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Good stop. for you. Um, but what I love about homeopathy is that it is not something that you just add this one on top of this one and then give this one. And then before you know it, you're on 12 different homeo- homeopathic treatments for the rest of your dog's life. Right. It, you do it. And as I learned from both you and Dr. Picarin is, and that's why Dr. Picarin doesn't like it just sold. Like you said, in that group, how you guys talk about like the whole bunch of stuff. Cause he right. says, you're not supposed to keep giving it for the rest of their life. That's not. No. And at all. giving it two and three times a day. And, If you work with a homeopathic veterinarian, we can better guide you as to what potency to use. So that's why you don't have to do the math Um, and how often to give it. I mean, I'll I'll often, and it isn't always, it depends. In some of the, well, let's back up. In most cases, I give a single dose and I do a follow-up in a month. 
and they don't get another dose. A That's single it. dose. One dose, a single dose of homeopathic medicine in my office. And then I recheck in a month to see if the medicine did anything. If it didn't, maybe it did a little something, maybe it did a lot. That gives me an idea. Well, okay, that was a total miss or wow, this was close to the right medicine, maybe not quite the right medicine. And I know where to go for from there. So I agree with you. I have clients that come in to see me and they're so well-meaning and, and I, I feel for them. I know they have spent a ton of money on the huge bag of supplements that they towed into my office. And they say, should I be giving this and this? And then I say, you know, well, I, you know, and I feel bad because, you know, I'm looking at the prices on them is $89 right. for this and, you know, 56 something for that. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, good Lord, not only that, but most of the time there's overlap and redundancies and some redundancies. Yep. And, you know, I'll say, well, look, just choose one or the other. And, the other thing I want to say to you is every supplement company is going to tell you just how fantastic their supplement is. And you're also going to find people online. Again, social media is a, a blessing and a curse. Yep. Oh, this supplement cured my dog's itching, stinky skin. And, yep. and so people go buy that. Well, that's going to fix it in my animal. No supplement is going to fix anything that's going on with your pet. Whole food will, homeopathic medicine will, but no supplement is going to fix it. I do prescribe supplements. And the key reason I do it, and not a ton, uh, the client today with dog with seizures went home with three supplements, just three. That's it. And uh, one was just a whole body supplement, vitamin, mineral, whatever. And then the other one was specific to the nervous system. And the other one was an essential fatty acid for the uh, neurologic disease, inflammatory, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, yeah. um, so, I, and, and of course, a homeopathic medicine was given. But what I do with the supplements is I intend to use them as kind of a bridge to try to help the animal to maybe have a little bit less symptoms while they are healing with homeopathic medicine. And then gradually, hopefully I can get down to one or two supplements and that's it. Um, maybe zero. It depends on how, how much they're willing to work with the diet because I love to get the majority of your nutrients and supplements in whole real food. Yeah. And honestly, there are some people that say, I can't make my own food. It's just, I can't go there. I, my yeah. lifestyle and the woman today, you don't know who she is. So I'm not breaking confidentiality has a, what sounds like a very severe autistic son. Um, and that's only one of her several children. So that plus, you know, a, a right. family and I, you know, the dog and the seizures and I get it. I get it. If we have to do pre-made, I don't think that there's a perfectly pre-made food out there. So I, I'm not opposed to some supplements, but it isn't a terrible idea to help supplement that a little bit and do the best we can to get people to maybe add and mix in right. and, you know, try to do some real food because I'm a big proponent of making your own food. You could choose your own ingredients. You could choose organic ingredients. You know what you're buying to the best of your ability. Right. Uh, that we don't really have any true organic probably anymore in this country, probably in the world, to be honest with you. But it's still a good idea to buy organic. It's going to be the closest you can get right now for the damages that we've done in this, you know, planet, world, whatever. Um, right. I prefer home prepared foods and I do recommend Dr. Pitcairn's recipes. And I encourage my clients to use vegetarian and vegan um, at least several times a week, if not, you know, in some cases, I want them to use vegetarian and vegan exclusively. Yeah. But yeah, I it, the case first. It's it there's so much controversy, it's really hard. But I've expressed many times on this show that I do a couple of days a week. Um, my dogs are eating vegetarian, so I but not completely. Um, but I do a lot of rotation and I try to get as much as I can. I'm, I'm I really want somebody to create a diet. I almost did. I started working with um somebody to create a, a diet that was um where it had a lot of goat's milk and a lot of eggs. So it was a little bit better as far as not killing animals to feed my animal, which is a right. big problem for me every time I'm feeding my animals. But mm -hmm. so it, it's difficult, but we do know that there's less toxicity in vegetables than there is in our meat sources. So um, well, eating lower on the food chain, you will be ingesting uh, fewer glyphosates and right. GMOs. Yeah. Um, so there's good validity for eating that, both people and animals. 
Um, you have to, it's real tricky with cats. So we have to be careful with cats because they're more obligate carnivores right. um, and dogs really aren't. I know that there are going to be people that are going to lose their minds over that. Oh no, dogs are carnivorous. And that's just not entirely so. In fact, I get so many people who come in, they're so fixated on grain free. And I said, well, what do you think? They, they eat the whole thing. They eat the intestines and everything inside the intestines. What do you think's inside the intestines of the animals they eat? Yeah. Well, that would be grains and it would be uh, greens and uh, vegetable matter. And I don't know about you, but the intestinal tract is a pretty large proportion of that animal. There's a lot of digestive tract from the mouth to the animal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a yeah, lot. yeah. Um, guess I'll be putting in a bigger garden. <laughs> this is D. <laughs> there you go, D. D. Yes, D. for you, D. You, you go for it. Yeah, D has a whole bunch of goats. I'm so jealous of her, too. You guys mm. are living my life. Sort of. I can't do the alligators and bugs in Florida, but I could do the open land. But alligators and bugs, I can't do. Um, well, I would. Well, it depends. If you're not near the waterways, um, you know, then you're you're going to be fine. You're never going to see an alligator. I They're think not that stray far from the water. I have to say, I'm pretty. I know I'm, this is my own little conspiracy theory. It's I'm just joking right now. This is my side of me. So before you guys send me hate mail. I think that Florida doesn't want Californians to move there because I'm getting all sorts of stuff about alligators knocking on people's doors out there. And <laughs> no, so, I okay, okay I get it. Here. I'm yeah. not going. I don't, I, want to, I don't want to damage the sensibilities, but uh, our, our state is quickly turning fascist. So uh, those of us that are Northern transplants and, and aren't kind of on the crazy wagon of fascism, yeah. Um, it, it is tough. No, they probably don't want the Californians, but Californians, come on in. I, I think oh, they don't. I, sensible brains, please come on in. Please. Every please. time I turn on my TV or something, I'm like, I see a new thing about an alligator knocking on someone's door in Florida. Some guy just got bit by one. I'm like, okay, okay. I'm, we're not going. I, I've used to, I haven't gone kayaking for quite some time, but I used to go kayaking and we would encounter alligators all the time and they don't bother you at all. You don't bother them. They don't bother you. Sure. But if okay. you are walking your cute little dog near the, the water, the edge of the water, that's maybe not such a good idea. And it's especially not a good idea during mating season because no. they're pretty, you know, they're pretty stirred up during mating season. But anyway, I know we're getting a little bit off. Of, it's okay. I know. I'm sorry. I got on the alligator thing because every time I think of Florida. Gee, I if you are my you neighbor, I, yeah. want, I want your goat's milk. Do you guys need to get connected because she's I'll got a whole doing. bunch of goats. Yes. Kayaking in Everglades. I assume she's yes. feeding organically. I hope. Oh, if yeah. If not, I can oh. help you with that, Dee, if you're not feeding organically. I'm, I I'm would guarantee that. I know she has her own page um, and she's mm -hmm. educating people so much. It's called Performative. It's called Healthy Paws. I can, anybody who is... Um, it, for those of you who don't know or didn't see on Saving Pets, we just came up with a list of other um, groups that we recommend. Uh, we were only allowed to put six and then um, it got hard. But D has a fabulous group um, called Performative Healthy Paws. I would recommend too. She has so much awesome stuff on hers as well. Um, uh, but there was something else I wanted to respond on here. First, I want to say hi to Roz and then Hello, get your I want to get your take on this as far as allergies. This is interesting because she says in 2019, her lab had came back with a test result saying that her um, dog was allergic to chicken. Um, but now she had is another one that says that it's not. It's perfectly fine years later, but she's afraid to still feed it. What do you uh, think? Well, I would say uh, feed, if you can, free range, antibiotic free. Yeah. If you can afford organic chicken, I would have no problem doing that. Yeah. Remember that the immune system is very uh, malleable. And this is the other thing about the allergy testings, which are pretty re ridiculous, honestly. We can do allergy tests six months apart and get completely different results. Because remember, the body, if you want to accept from an allopathic conversation that we have a overactive immune system, you can have fluctuations back and forth where this is the hot item this month and that's the hot item next month. And then depending on what we do or if we rotate proteins, then that sensitivity might settle down some or the test might be completely erroneous. Like the particular time the test was done, um, you know, maybe there was a, a greater sensitivity to chicken. That's why you have to use these allergy tests as a bit of a guide to help you say, well, until I'm working with hopefully a homeopath, 
or while I'm working with a homeopath, I want to know the things that might be big triggers or might be, and I say might be triggers because of the thing you say about the chicken, right? So right. that's the explanation for why your dog is okay now with chicken, wasn't before. Um, for And maybe the batch of chicken that they uh, used or the samples or whatever, maybe there was cleaner chicken. Maybe it was a matter of the glyphosate or uh, pesticides on the grains or whatever that are fed to the chickens. Um, it could be, sorry, Blossom, Blossom is like desperate to be in my lap because she's a lap baby. Um, so it could be any of those things. I wouldn't be afraid to feed the chicken. Um, but if you want to use the allergy test, just use them as a light guide to give you an idea of the things that you might want to avoid um, while you're working with a homeopath to balance um, the animal to a more homeostatic uh, state where the symptoms of allergies, because it's not a disease, it's just a symptom, that the symptoms of the allergies get better. And then you won't have to worry about diet restrictions. Yeah. I just was, um, Sherry is one of the admins with me on um, Saving Pets. And she feeds, she makes the food every single night, which is awesome. I mean, whoa, I know. I know. Whoa, I'm, I'm impressed. I I'm always, cool. that kind of stuff always makes me feel like such a bad parent. It's kind of, I think it, it's like no different. You know what it feels like? It feels like when I see this, Sherry, is like back in the 19, like 80s when moms were starting to go back to work and there was the one mom who like always brought the homemade cupcakes and the homemade everything <laughs> like school. And then mm -hmm. my mom's over here like, that's me. I'm like, I, my, my kids are getting like the, the store bought. I'm not, I wish I had, I could do that. I think it's great. She doesn't feed veggies. And I think that's fine too. There's so many things that you can do. It's not necessarily, you know, well, I think that vegetables and healthy grains should be fed. Um, because I think that grain free is too much protein. Um, I don't agree with the really high protein diets. I think it's hard on the system. It's hard on the liver. It's hard on the kidneys. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't think it's particularly healthy. So I like to dilute my pre-made raw meat um, with uh, organic squash and organic pumpkin um, and organic sweet potato and any vegetables that I might be eating or chopping up or preparing for myself. I'll, you know, I'll puree or chop uh, some of those up and add them. Um, so I, I don't necessarily agree with that. And I think variety like that is a good idea. Um, to just feed like meat and bones and organs and um, and little or no uh, vegetable matter or grains, I think is not healthy, not helpful, yeah. not for a dog anyway. Yeah, it's just it's it it's hard. It's there's so many people doing so many things, and I've seen dogs flourish on with and without. So I never want you know to make people think one way. I, I, I get what you're saying, but on the other end, I've also seen dogs do really well on all veggie diets. And I've seen dogs do really well on all meat diets. So mm -hmm. it's hard. And that's why I kind of, I'm a middle of the gr ground person. Like I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do a few days of all veggie. And then I'm going to do a few days of all meat. And I kind of try to mimic well, a little I'm, bit. I'm big into rotation. And somebody yeah. also talked about rotating proteins, which I agree with. Yeah. Um, that's probably Sherry. That's why if anybody goes to my website, they're not going to find a recommended diet because yeah. I think it's critically important for us to evaluate the pet, work with somebody like Carrie, work with some, a homeopathic veterinarian such as myself um, to assess what is optimal for your pet. I had a Corgi puppy one time that was doing really poorly on um, home prepared food and she wasn't growing properly. She wasn't developing. She was stunted in her growth. And she and they didn't do vaccinations, so that wasn't why. And I said, you know, we need to do something different here. I actually told her to get uh, really high end kibble and start supplementing the diet with high end kibble. Yeah, I, it could have been that they weren't balancing the diet correctly. Some right. people want to do their own home cooking, and I can't tell when you say, well, I'm feeding chicken and I'm giving this and I'm giving that. I don't know if that's a complete and balanced diet. Maybe it wasn't balanced. But two out of three of her dogs were um, too thin um, and the puppy wasn't growing and developing. And she did flourish after we put her on some commercial food. What I had said to them is we don't have to do this forever, but we need to do something um, different. Um, even if I, it's not like my go-to, I almost never recommend kibble. I mean, yeah. almost never. And in this particular case, I said, I think we need to do, do this and see how she responds to it. 
It yeah. also could have been the homeopathic medicine I gave. That is a possibility. But I felt like I was running out of time because she was young and growing. And I didn't want yeah. her to have lifelong illness because we wanted to be a Nazi about how we were going to feed. That's so, what I love, love, love about you. And I've had to do that also where mm -hmm. I've had to, I just recently had a, a, a client and the, the mother is ill herself. And so there's a lot of stress in the house. And then the dad was getting stressed because one wanted to do all species appropriate, but it wasn't working and it was just too much stress. And I finally just told the dad, look, just go get some kibble and just do this for now because his, his wife is not doing well and right. it's a lot of stress for both of them. And right. it, it sometimes we have to just, it, it's not going to help the dog. Right. And which is what we're supposed to do. If we get that Nazi kind of, no, we can only feed this way and only that way. Right. I never want to be that person. It can't, I can't be that person. So. Right. And, you know, I try to be sensitive to people's needs, you know, even like the client who came today, um, you know, I explore with them, you know, well, what about this? Do you think you could handle, you know, pre-made food or pre-made raw food? Um, you know, might you be able to work with that? Um, she wasn't feeding kibble. No, she was feeding kibble. Excuse me. She was feeding pedigree, which was a little scary. But anyway, and um, <clears throat> forgive me for saying that. If I'm sorry, I did it too. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. No, no worries. But anyway, um, we can do a lot better than that. Yeah. And then when she comes back again in a month, you know, we'll see. I think it's a month, six weeks. I can't remember exactly because yeah. my schedule was full. Sweetheart, you're going to have to get down. Even 15 pounds feels heavy. There you go. Good job. So, you know, we'll see how she's doing. If she feels overwhelmed and she couldn't do any of the vegetarian in the, you know, couple days a week or is struggling with, uh, doesn't like the, some of the suggestions of the raw food that I recommended or the pre-made foods or anything like that, that fine. You know, we'll see what we can do. But in this case, it's going to be hard because most dogs that have seizures will do very poorly on kibble. Um, that'll actually promote seizures. So right. that's almost one of those cases along with, there are some other ones as well that you can't really get by with kibble. Right. Um, that's, right. that's a tough one, but I, I think she's perfectly okay to be off of kibble. So it, let's go back to homeopathy a little bit. Cause I don't want to keep you too late. And I know it's really late on your time, but just to <laughs> kind of take this full circle a little bit. Yeah. In the beginning, you had mentioned that if there was an acute problem and something mm -hmm. happened, that you would support somebody kind of having their own little arsenal of homeopathic remedies. Could you tell us, like you had mentioned one or two of them, maybe one or two that might work for something that we could give people a little something to think about? Um, sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I, I, I am perfectly fine talking about homeopathic medicines and some common usages. And I want to use the example of Arnica because that's one of the ones I brought up earlier. Yeah. Um, Arnica is one of the number one homeopathic medicines that's used for any kind of trauma. Could be head trauma, eye trauma, uh, bruising. You smacked your leg and it's just, you know, throbbing and really painful. There might be some really specific things about Arnica. Like, for instance, Arnica, uh, if you're in an Arnica state, um, you're having a lot of pain from an injury or whatever. And you don't want to be touched. You don't want to, it doesn't, you don't want to rub it. You don't want anybody to touch it. Uh, stay away. Don't touch me. That that's going to hurt. That's going to be crazy hurting. Understand that if you have an injury, there are many homeopathic medicines for injuries, many, many of them. And so not every injury is going to put you in an Arnica homeopathic state. However, a lot of injuries put people in a homeopathic state of Arnica. So that's why it tends to be a remedy that's so effective for the majority. That means that you might take Arnica for an injury and then find out, well, that didn't do anything. So homeopathy must be nothing. You might be, you might have actually been moved into a Staphysagria state or a Bellus Perennis state. You might not have ever been in an Arnica state. So for most injuries that involve bruising or eye injuries, head injuries, and of course, God forbid, if you have a head injury, please go and seek help. Um, I did, I'm going to tell you quickly, I had this, I think this was in the early 2000, no, probably late 90s. Um, it was New Year's Eve night, 
and I was out. I, I don't really drink, so I wasn't really drinking, but I was out with friends at a party or whatever. And for whatever crazy reason, because I'm a crazy homeopathic veterinarian, I had a, ba a, a doctor bag in my trunk at the time, and it was filled with some homeopathic medicines. So I'm driving along, and in front of me, I see a cat get hit by a car trying to run across the street. Not, not only got hit by one car, but by two cars, and was in the middle of the road, curled up and immobile. And I thought, oh my God, that cat might be dead. So I pull into a bar parking lot, because that was the closest, safest place to pull over ironically, an interesting place to have to pull over. And um, I ran over and I, I safely moved the cat the best that I could. It was risky to move the cat, but in the middle of the road, it's a really bad place to be. And it was female cat, had a blood coming out of the ears, the nose, the eyes, and she was completely unconscious, but still breathing. So I quickly got homeopathic arnica out of my uh, kit and I gave her some homeopathic arnica. Well, by now, because I had moved the cat off the side of the road over in this bar parking lot, now I have an aggregate of people because it was, you know, New Year's Eve that came out and they see me putting these magic little white pellets in this cat's mouth. The witch and doctor. I, I asked them if they could please get me, you know, a cardboard box because she was very bloody. So no offense. I didn't quite want to put her in my car all bloody. And I, I wanted to see if they might have, you know, maybe some towels or something like that, you know, even paper towels, something like that you can bring to me. So they go to try to fetch that. And I gave a second dose of Arnica because, of course, this was a very severe case. By the time they came out, they couldn't find a box, but that was all right. By the time they came out, the, the kitty was starting to come too. And uh, she was, you know, kind of scared. And then in the next moment or so, she com came completely to and she ran off. I couldn't even control her. She ran off and ran under a car. That's so and, cool. And she was, you know, I watched her for a little while and she's staring at me with her big saucer eyes, like, you know, terrified or, and I'm like, hey, I didn't do it. I swear. All I did was try to help you. And you know, <laughs> I, I was nervous to leave her, but finally I did leave her. And as far as I know, and as far as I could tell, she was fine. Wow. I've done a lot of emergency medicine. Well, probably not fine. I'm sure she's going to be really sore, but um, but she completely came out of unconsciousness. Working as an emergency veterinarian, which I did for a number of years, um, even including to the time that I was learning homeopathic medicine, and I used homeopathic medicine at the emergency clinic. I had the best colleague. Um, but anyway, during that time, I'd use like you know, fast action steroids for, you know, brain injuries and things like that, unconsciousnesses. I never in my whole life saw an animal respond that way. That's crazy. And if you could have seen the, the look on these people's face. They said, oh my God, what were those magic white balls that you put in, <laughs> in that cat's mouth? What did you do? So I said, well, it's homeopathic medicine. And they just said, but I never seen anything like that. And they were just in awe. I mean, it was bartenders. I don't think they were wasted or anything. So hopefully they remembered some things, but I don't really know. And I, I hope that so, right? ended up finding, going back to her home safely, um, you know, with, you know, not having any residual effects like seizures. Yeah. But you, you aren't always in an Arnica state, but it's the first go-to remedy uh, with a brain bleed or, um, you know, especially secondary to trauma. And so it was a reasonable remedy to give. And in an acute situation, I might change remedies rather quickly. There are other remedies for brain, brain bleeds too. So other remedies that are good is Ledum, L-E-D-U-M for bite wounds. Um, it's almost the number one remedy. If that remedy doesn't work for you, then I would go to Arnica. And then if you had an internal um, injury, deeper injury, like a spay and your pet doesn't respond to Arnica for pain management, uh, for instance, because Arnica is really good for post-surgery uh, for most animals. And spays is such a deep internal surgery. Sometimes you need bellus perennis, uh, for example. So um, there aren't really, there's no acute remedy for allergies because that's a chronic disease. It's not an acute disease at all. Are there any other acute diseases that um, might come to your mind that you might want a, a list or an idea of remedies? Mm -hmm. I, I think I'll give you one, uh, another one or two. Um, if you have a toxicity, um, Nux vomica could be your friend if you have a toxicity. Um, if you have food poisoning, um, arsenicum album could be your remedy, especially if you're really restless with the nausea and the diarrhea. Um, uh, any other ones? That would, that, would, would that work for like chocolate? Like, it could. It, yeah. It could. And yeah. again, realize that not all toxicities, because, I, you know, I give you one remedy. There's... It, you, there's an infinite 
you know, infinite. There's right. thousands of homeopathic medicines. I, I'm going to give you a good example because I, I think that this might help to drive the point home really well. Um, years ago, um, I think I, I was living in St. Petersburg, Florida at the time, and I had a stilt home and my cats and I caged in the whole back of my stilt home. So they had like a two story uh, caged in area that they could, you know, go roam around in, you know, it's like a patio and, you know, decking and all that. And um, I don't, I didn't see it happen, but I was assuming that my Cornish Rex kitty um, had fallen from the deck because all of a sudden he was non weight bearing in his uh, hind leg. I think it was the right hind, but don't quote me on that. And I, so I immediately reached for Arnica and it did nothing. And I thought, well, now that's really strange. And then I don't remember, I tried maybe another acute remedy. Um, in the meanwhile, I took x-rays and I realized that there was a fracture of the head of the hip joint. And I thought, well, I wonder why Arnica didn't work because, you know, it's a trauma, it's a broken bone. So I think I tried a broken bone remedy like Symphytum or Calcarea Phosphoricum. So that might be some other remedies you might think of for broken bones. Um, go get your leg or arm or broken piece mended, but you can use the homeopathic medicine to hasten healing and to make sure hopefully that you don't get a non-union um, where the bones don't knit together again. So anyway, I tried those remedies that nothing worked. That didn't work at all. And I thought, well, and this wasn't a good length of time, by the way, it's only about 24 or 48 hours. And so anyway, then I thought, well, I need to sit down and really work my cat's case up because obviously this isn't an acute remedy problem. So I worked his case up. He was a bit of an odd duck. He was kind of a strange cat. And long story short, the remedy that looked best was Staphysagria. It isn't well known for trauma, but it can be a trauma remedy. It can be a post-surgical remedy. It could be that. Uh, but the more common ones are the ones I had already used. And after one dose of Staphysagria, he stopped limping altogether. And he wow. never had surgery, never had any intervention. Wow. And you know, if we don't, so I, my, my point in saying that is that just because we have a likely trauma and we use the remedy that, you know, oh, we talked about Arnica. Oh, it's got to be Arnica. And, and it's not Arnica. And, the, and when you look back on it, like he didn't care if I picked him up. He was painful if I manipulated the joint. But, you know, he didn't mind being touched and petted. And he was fine with that. He, he wasn't in an Arnica state. But I mm -hmm. overlooked that because I'm like, ah, trauma, it's got to be Arnica. And it yeah. wasn't a Monica case at all. He was a Staphysagria case and his personality got better after Staphysagria. So it still probably was a trauma, but it's just that it put him in a Staphysagria condition, not in an Arnica state. So um, always seek out help from a qualified homeopathic veterinarian because you can use acute remedies. But I want you to realize that um, unless you're using the brain of somebody like myself, you know, that has been well trained in homeopathy, um, you could go round and round and really delay proper intervention. Because if you had done that on your own, you might have said, well, I'll, I'll give Arnica every day for a week, which might not be appropriate at all. Right. Maybe it would be, maybe it wouldn't be. And your pet's not getting any better. I'm not going to wait a whole week. Right. Not with, not with a pain case or trauma. I'm not going to wait. Now, skin itching, they're not going to die from that. Right. They're not right. going to be suffering and misery. I understand it's uncomfortable. I've never right. seen a scratchy animal, like completely suffering. Why do I say that? Because the minute they're not itching and they go for a walk and they're wagging their tail and they're really happy, they're not worried about the next time they're going to be itchy. Right. Moving on with their day and having a good day. And they might be uncomfortable in the moment in that period that they are itching. So that's another thing I always tell people is don't panic. Yes, I know they're still having that symptom. It's going to take a while for that to clear up. Be patient. But if I have an acute injury case or seizures or uh, animals not eating at all and very sick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time waiting a long time to see if the remedy is doing something. I need to see some positive effect from that homeopathic medicine um, for that more critical patient, whether it's acute or chronic or an acute flare up of chronic disease. You know what is unfair to homeopathy is that allopathic medicine, and I've seen this a million times, I was just helping a woman on saving pets and they just keep giving her a different antibiotic. And somehow that's acceptable in allopathic treatments. Oh, that antibiotic didn't work. Let's try this. That antibiotic didn't work. Let's try this. But for some reason, I see people try homeopathy and they try it one remedy 
and it didn't work and they throw it out the window and say, oh, that's, see, that's just a bunch of hoopla. But they'll, but I, I think because the dominant paradigm in the United States and a lot of places in sure. Europe is allopathic medicine. Sure. And people give allopathic veterinarians a huge pass. Yeah. By the time they get to me, they're like, well, it's not fixed yet. Well, it's not fixed yet. Yep. Well, how many years has your pet been itching? Oh, well, it's been like five well. or six years <laughs> or 12 years or whatever, well. right? So right. I, I, we can't please everybody all the time. And the people that are absolutely destined to need a quick fix of anything are, are probably not well suited for homeopathic medicine. Right. Because and eventually they're going to get no quick fix in allopathic medicine because no. when everything piles up into a heap of poo and the animal is a hot mess, yep. there's going to be no quick fix. A um, hot, steeping pile of mess. Just, yeah, it'll be a really yeah. big mess. So I, I think that if by doing what we're doing here in having this dialogue, I hope it helps people to understand the other thing I want to say is that I've had people come to me and say, well, you're experimenting on my pet. You keep experimenting because I'm changing homeopathic medicines. I said, oh, well, then I guess your other vet that was changing antibiotics was experimenting That's with my antibiotics. Point. That's my point. So, but they, I, I want to drive time. that home. This is not an experiment. Homeopathy has been around a lot longer than Western a medicine. A lot longer. Was. That I was a surprised to know. Yeah. yeah. And actually is the least proven medicine and how many times and i want to even bring up like the covid jab there was a very short period of time of study i understand the urgency in getting that ineffective um method of trying to control covid out on the market um but it, it's it's the least studied medicine small pools of individuals whether it's animals or people uh for six weeks at a time and look we're using like cytopoint or uh, flea and tick poisons or heartworm prevention, which I'm not a disbeliever in heartworm prevention, by the way, so don't take that the wrong way. Um, but, you know, it, all of these medications are used for years, years yeah. repetitively. And they're not studied for years. They're I thrown out on the market, sometimes experimentally on your pet, meaning that they're kind of testing it out on your animal, see if it might even be something for human medicine or taking a human medicine and experimenting on our animals with it to see if it'll kind of do the same thing. Right. So if you think Western medicine is safer, it is your comfort zone. What I want to say to you is it's your comfort zone because it's what you're most familiar with. Yeah. And homeopathy is not a comfort zone because you're like, what's that? It's like an energy medicine. And I don't know how that works. And what do you mean more dilute? It's more concentrated or it's more potent. I don't know. So be open-minded to venture into something that is outside of your comfort zone because it might shock you about how effective it is, how safe it is. Um, at least we're going to call it do no harm. Right. When I graduated That's from why I say one, that. Of I, one of the oaths that we had to promise to was above all, do no harm. Mm -hmm. I went right out in veterinary medicine. I did a whole bunch of veterinary harm. It wasn't on purpose. I don't feel that my colleagues are doing it on purpose. They don't know any other way. And for those of us that were brave enough, because we have targets on our chest, back, what do you want to say? Um, because oh, oh. pets are not well liked by our community. Right. <clears throat> Why? Because we tell you not to vaccinate or not to over vaccinate, to feed whole real foods um, and don't use drugs. You know, can you use something else instead? You right. know, and, and also I want to say before we part um, or wrap up, Please be kind to your allopathic vets. If you're going to go to an allopathic vet, they only know allopathic medicine. If they haven't been open-minded enough to pursue anything else, that's what they know. Don't expect them to prescribe homeopathic medicine, Chinese herbs, acupuncture, uh, even supplements necessarily. So, you know, seek out a homeopathic veterinarian. Seek out a veterinarian that works for you. I really applaud my colleagues that are open-minded that say, I don't know anything about homeopathy, but... Um, go ahead. Why don't you try that? Because, you know, the, all these, you know, all these medicines we've been using haven't really been working. Not working. Thank um, you for so they, And they're open minded enough to say, go ahead and do that as opposed to all that stuff doesn't work. How do they know if they're not a homeopath? If you're not trained in homeopathy, you cannot comment on whether it does or doesn't work. Right. Period. Right. I hope that I, I'm just, no, I'm glad that you said to be kind to the allopathic vets because I have been um putting together our thriving pet expo in the end of september and i'm working on it and um I, one of the things i say is i'm 
I'm not there to change the mind of the pet parent that might go. What we want this to do is to help the pet parent better communicate to the allopathic veterinarian because that's where we're going to make the biggest impact. Mm-hmm. If, one, if we can change one allopathic veterinarian's mindset, that, that's thousands of animals that are going to be better. So that's really what, what I'm trying to do. And sometimes people think, oh, you hate vets. I, I don't. I, I absolutely don't hate vets. I just wish sometimes I get frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> that's easy to get frustrated. Sometimes I want to say to really your point, Perry, that, um, that you viewers are more powerful. Why so do you think powerful. there are, quote, integrative or holistic veterinarians popping up everywhere? Yeah. Because people want an alternative and they're like, Whoo, I don't want to give up my allopathic medicine. But if I add some natural medicine, maybe I'll get more clients. Yeah, that's why they're doing it. It's not because they're really embracing holistic medicine to some degree. Some of them may be. But what they're really doing is saying, wow, there's a big niche here. I'm grabbing hold of that. I'm going to draw these people in. And then unfortunately, a lot of you folks out there get drawn in and misled because you think you're going to a holistic vet and you're really going to an allopathic veterinarian that's offering some holistic modalities. And again, they don't make my colleagues like that are not bad veterinarians necessarily. They truly aren't. Neither are the allopathic veterinarians. The ones that won't listen to you. Uh, the ones that uh, shame you for doing better things, better healthy things for your animals, shame on those veterinarians is right. what I'm going to say. Right. Find another vet. Ones that say, I'm not going to see you unless you give vaccines to your your dog with seizures or your dog with cancer. Find another vet. That's bad medicine. You don't have to be a homeopath to know that. Right. So find a better vet. Um, But for the most part, I think my colleagues are trying really hard. They just have limited tools. Their tools in allopathic medicine are extremely limiting and harmful in the majority of cases. Not 100%, but a lot of the cases. And they don't do it on purpose. They're not doing it because they'd like to hurt your pet. Oh, sure. There's no other way to treat. Yeah. So you need to seek that out for yourself and be your pet's own advocate. Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, they're just in it for the money. They're just in it for the money. Well, no, they're not. But, um, but I think that- I'm sure there's always some in the, in the pool, but for the most part, understand veterinarians are like any other profession. We work with animals. We don't work with animals because we just would like a job. I mean, it is tough to be a vet. So okay, the majority of veterinarians love being a veterinarian and really do want to help. And it isn't just all about the money, but veterinarians would like to make a good living like anybody else like sure. you, like your neighbor, like yeah, your, yeah. your children, like your parents. Um, and we have to make a living. We can't do this for free. Um, and the yeah. most of us have debts. We can't do it for free. So, yeah, but I don't think any, I don't, there's not a whole lot of vets out there that are making millions of dollars. Like it's not, most of us not, not. right. Most, <laughs> I have a lot of vet friends. They are, I, they're not wealthy. So I, it's, it's very hard to do. One Probably thing the wealthiest like, ones are the ones that have multiple clinics and they leverage with a lot right. of associates. The corporate uh, veterinary corporate. hospitals are doing just fine. Um, and I'd encourage you to kind of steer fear, clear from the corporate ones. There are some good vets at the corporate hospitals, but their hands can be tied because there are corporate requirements on how they're supposed to practice medicine. They tell the veterinarian they're not going to tell them how to practice medicine but they tell them to upsell every single vaccination. Oh my God. Look I had to show you. you. I have it. I have another, you guys all know I bottle baby. I'm, I'm bottle baby. These are my, <laughs> they're leaving pretty soon though. They're, they're old oh enough. My now. Gosh. Look how they, cute. Look uh, the this markings is, on that one. I know it's in a, she, it's she all females. Nice. And I named them um, B Arthur and uh, Rue McClanahan and Rose White. Every, oh my God, we're dating ourselves. I know, I love, but I love it. All, it was three girls. I had to. Oh I my had gosh. to. I so, hope they don't change those. Somebody needs to adopt all three. This is, B, this is B. This is B. Arthur. So oh, B. B. Arthur. I don't, is yeah. Um, I don't know where Betty White is. I'm sure you can figure out what color she is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Betty White is running around here, and Rue McClanahan is right there. Uh, but they're about ready to leave. One thing I would encourage people to do to try to get the veterinary world to change is to stop going. Ooh, look at here's Rue. Oh, now you get to see. Okay. There's Rue. 
Oh, this Rue. is Rue McClanahan. How cute. <laughs> I know, oh, I know, right? Yes. Um, you know what? I know it probably will I, I do. They're so oh. much fun to watch. But oh, I bottle fed said these babies. Goat's milk D, if you're still there. They went straight on to goat's milk, raw, unpasteurized. Yes. Awesome. From day oh, one. Awesome. Now they're eating a fully raw meat mm -hmm. organs, gross stuff. But one of the things I would really love, and I, I know it's wishful thinking, but I would really love it if people, I can't even do it because there isn't any other option for me. But if we would stop going to veterinarians that are selling these flea and tick medications that we know are causing seizures, if we just called around and said, do you sell flea and tick medication? And they said, oh yeah, we have whatever you want, some Parica. What, I don't know if I should say stuff like that, but yeah, yeah, we have it. Um. <clears throat> what if what if people started saying hey two crazy cat ladies uh, <laughs> awesome. speaking of have you met rue mcclanahan <laughs> you need you need all three of these kittens because they are like amazingly cute i, I always betty white but we can guess what betty, betty white, white i don't know where she is mm -hmm. um I, I always name my litters if they're two in pairs, and these happen to be a triplet, because I have the idea that if they're named Rue McCannahan, B. Arthur, and Betty White, someone will go, well, gosh, we have to get them together. Yeah. So that's my, my plan, right? Yeah. Um, but if we could do that, if we could start calling vet hospitals, and when they say that they sell that flea and tick medication, if we could nicely say, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm looking for a veterinarian that doesn't sell that stuff, Maybe then is when we get veterinarians to, because just like you said, we have the power. All you we do. have. I all mean, the you power. are why there are integrative vets, and we need to produce more homeopathic veterinarians, in my yeah. opinion. Um, but you are why there are more uh, integrative veterinarians, better known as holistic. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah, the kittens are freaking amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry that I can't show you Betty White. I don't know where she is, but um, <laughs> she's a she looks more like a rag doll. Oh wow! So she's more of a long hair. Yeah, but I'm a little concerned about her getting adopted because the I'm sorry, the stupid animal shelter right now is not allowing people to go in and see animals to be adopted. Really? No. So you have to find them online and their picture. And I hate to say this, but if she was born into the real, the what, what human world, she is not a, she's not photogenic. Oh, Tim's bringing me Betty White. Oh, he calls her Uncle Fester. But I Maybe love her. She's find a client. Oh my goodness! But <gasps> she, oh, she's adorable. Isn't she cute? But she doesn't photograph well. She is not photogenic. She's really. Adorable. She's so oh. cute. He calls her Uncle Fester because of her around her eyes. <laughs> but she's cute. Oh, but do you see the Uncle Fester in her? Uh huh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but when we take pictures of her, she looks uh -huh. like a like a mangy little kitty, and she's not. And her name's her name's Betty White. <laughs> well, what needs to happen is she should be photographed. The three should be photographed together. Or you need to find a client um, that's going to adopt all three. Um, she looks like she might be some kind of Siamese mix. Does she have a um, like blue eyes or not? Yeah, she does. She's probably okay. some kind of Siamese or I don't know. Well, who they knows? Have like, multiple parents, so you never know. She, what you she definitely probably came from a different parent. I don't know yeah. than the other two, but she's uh -huh. she's actually the most friendly one. Um, she's the well, most she's my kind of kitty because I have yeah. a soft spot for the Siamese kitties. Uh -huh. I don't mind the Uncle Fester eyes. I'm okay with that. Okay, so. What but I need kitty. another cat like I need an extra orifice. Oh, right? no, I can get her to you. The last kitty I found a home for, we did a caravan. I can get her to Florida. Oh, my just goodness. Say the, just say the word. I'll get her there. We did it. We did a, a caravan with one of the last kitty kitties mm -hmm. that I have. But anyway. I, I, honestly, I honestly believe that um, if you're going to adopt a kitten, honestly, that you should do that at least in pairs, if not the threes. Yeah. yeah. Because um, I, I made that mistake when I brought in my Devon Rex kitten. He terrorized the living crap out of my other cats. Aww. And eventually the male like was kind of okay with him. But my female is like, I'd like to kill you. Yeah. And he's never forgiven him for it. Because now he's like, oh, okay. You know, well, of course he's older. But um, anyway. I well, I think cats should always be in at least pairs because 
They mm-hmm. spend so much time grooming and if they don't have they, grooming each other, if you've right. ever had, like they groom each other and right. if they don't have their little friend to groom, then right. next thing you know, they're over grooming themselves and it, that's not good. Well, so, I just think two kittens growing up together or three for that matter really? is fine. Um, I, I just four? think having the siblings <clears throat> together and a good, yeah. um, a good client of mine up in Connecticut, um, she does tons and tons of cat rescue and kittens and all kinds of things. And she'll almost never, unless it's a singlet kitten, uh, she'll almost never let the kittens, and even if it's a singlet, she'll pair it up with another, you know, like an unrelated uh, kitten pair. If they get along and they're really good, she'd always pair them up. And I just, she started doing that. And I thought, God, I I should have taken two from the Devon Rex litter. I wish I had, because I really caused a lot of angst in my adult cats at the time. And uh, that was really, that was really obnoxious. And I think to his overall mental development was not as good as it would have been if he actually, you know, came with one of his siblings. But in my brain, I was like, now only one more, that's it. Only one more, you know, and I just, and then I brought him home and I'm like, oh my God, look what he's doing to my other adult cats. Yeah. Cackling them. And I mean, he was just a maniac. (laughs) I mean, a total maniac. I'm like, oh my God, I I made a mistake. But by that time, the kittens Thanks for the, for for the plug on getting people to adopt more cats. We need it. Yes, please. Absolutely. This trio needs to go together because they are so gorgeous. All all three of them are can't break up the golden girls no you cannot not Our, a lot of people know they're like Who's have a here that is uh is totally interested in this trio uh the two crazy cat ladies they're amazing come on, two cherry crazy cat ladies let's go come on they, they have a, they have they have a i know them and they have their own brood but uh but mm-hmm. they're huge supporters in everything that that we that you're doing and that we're oh, all that's doing awesome um, Good. they're, they're raw feeding kitties and all sorts of stuff. So they're pretty amazing. So, uh, and the two crazy cat ladies, this is Dr. Robin Canazero. They do a podcast too. So. Uh, oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They have a really awesome. great, great communication. So, well, listen, it is 635 and we kept you so long. <laughs> 635 for you, my friend. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. That's what I meant. 935 yeah, for me. It is much later for you. So right. um, well, you can see it's a little on the black dark side i can after. always see because it starts to get darker in your room yeah so uh-huh. i'm gonna go ahead and let you go any last minute things i know you want to say something got to say something to these one more thing <laughs> please find a homeopathic veterinarian and you can find one if you don't choose to work with me you can find one from the a v h dot org um and you'll be able to find a homeopathic veterinarian be open to being able to doing a phone consultation. We could do videos. If you set up Zoom, we can do Zoom. I'm not tech savvy, so I don't know how to do Zoom. And uh, but some people, some other people do. But there's a ton of things that we can see. So for those of us that do phone consultations, seek one of us out. You won't necessarily find a homeopath that is right in your back, you know, back your neighborhood or whatever. You might have to drive a distance. Um, so you know, please find a homeopathic veterinarian if this in any way spoke to you this evening. And um, I really thank you guys for coming and joining us and and taking your time to have a listen to us. I I hope that we have taught you some things, uh, helped you with some things. Yeah, you're amazing. You always teach us so much about homeopathy and and uh, it's great. And Sherry, I want to thank you too, Sherry, for being here. She's like I told you, one of the um, moderator admins. I don't even know the difference between any of that, but um, Sherry is amazing. And she's given out some information she gave you guys um, earlier. If you look back on this, you'll see that she had mentioned um, Dr. Canazero had mentioned Arnica and Sherry had mentioned a product that she uses. It's called Your Go To. Um, it has Arnica in it. So if you're looking for something, it is one that we both recommend. I actually really like it too. It has a little bit of the Arnica in it in, in case somebody wanted to have is something. That, is that a topical product? Because you can use... Um, it's a spray. Topically. Oh, it's a spray. It's okay. spray. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a little spray. I actually use that for mm-hmm. um, when I'm grooming dogs sometimes. I can give a couple of sprays of that and it really does have an effect on them when they're just... Mm-hmm freaked out, you know, yeah. um, sometimes it has a mixture of stuff in it, but it does have Arnica in it. So I'm glad that you brought that up and that Sherry was able to type I, that. I in. also, not to take away from Sherry, but um, I like five flower formula, which you can oh, no, that's find great. Online. What's yeah, it called? Five flower formula. 
Oh, awesome. It's the okay. Same formulation as Rescue Remedy, but it's organic. Um, and it is, uh, it's by a small company because the Bach flower, I believe was bought out by a corporate conglomerate. Of course. Yeah. That's why you can find it in Walmart now. So right. it just of course. causes me a lot of concern when I see stuff like that. Yeah, me too. So, me um, too. I like five flower formula. It's a small company, uh, great products. They have all kinds of flower essences, but the five flower formula is a nice one to start with, but you that's probably awesome. knew about that one already. A uh, little bit. Yeah. Um, but like I said, homeopathy is still, I'm really in my infancy of it. Anytime I find somebody, I jump, they're just jump on board. I'll teach you more. Bring me. Cases. I got to come out there so I can you learn. Do. I need, need to come out here and yeah. uh, sit through some cases and it's that's what I need to do. Transformative, you know, to see, and not everything is going to be so brilliant, but, um, you know, it's transformative. And I don't want to suggest to the listeners that we cure cancer, but, Sometimes when we see tumors, you know, like dry up and fall off and it's just, I think there's nothing in allopathic medicine that does things it like does that. that. Right. Nothing, no, I agree. nothing at all. And animals get revitalized and, um, uh, yes, that, uh, John, that is correct. Okay. Oh, By you, John. Flower. Yeah. Um, that, that is, the company. um, it's a great company. Um, and I've been buying their products for a long time. I like to use those, um, you know, in a lot of situations that I might be in. And if there's an obvious homeopathic medicine to give, um, then uh, one of the ones you might consider for your really terrified kids is Ignatia. Um, that could be a good one. Aconite. Um, that's, that could be another good one. Um, yeah, and for good. ones that are a little bit violent with you, then Nux Vomica might be a little bit helpful. So those Please. are ones I think of. Sherry, you guys should probably, I'm just going to say this because mm -hmm. if you're serious, I know that Dr. Canazero was looking, you were still looking for help. I am. I am. Yeah, yes. Karen, I'm and actively, a retired yes. nurse. You guys should hook up. Yeah. So uh, uh, private message me because I have a lot of um, resumes and I'm trying to make a decision by the end of this week or beginning of the very beginning of next. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of decent, uh, one probably good candidate. She doesn't have experience. That's the hard part, but um, her personality seems really great. So, and I took your suggestion. Um, I went on Indeed. You, you did. That's yeah. I got flooded with resumes. Yeah. So some of them didn't come to fruition and that's fine, but. Yeah, a lot of them don't, but it does open it up for you and you can kind of regulate, you know, the cost. Right. So you can kind of decide how much you want to spend. So, um, well, oh, I, I, sh I shouldn't say, um, I, I I haven't gotten a bill and I don't think they took a credit card from me. So I don't know what I'm doing. I'm Maybe like, you got some kind of like free. I, I have don't know. no idea. I hope to close this process. Like I said, the end of the week, beginning of next. So once I do that, I'll close it out and I guess I'll get a surprise. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> um, but I haven't used them before, but I don't yeah. recall giving them a credit card. Maybe I did. And I don't remember, but I don't huh. think so. I so know. I was like, Ooh, okay. Well, I have to skate along. If I keep getting resumes, I'll just go ahead and take them. I'm all right with that. But yeah. anyway, so thank you for that suggestion. And Sherry, um, well, a lot of my Canadian clients, well, I have clients in Canada also, but a lot of my Canadian clients will summer in Florida. So you should think about that. doesn't mean yeah. you'd be good yeah. working because that then you'd only be like part of the year. I'd really yeah. like somebody year round, but um, I connect anyway. You could private message me. You can look me up on Facebook. Um, just yeah. make sure you say nice things, Sherry. <laughs> People say, what should I call you? And I said, as long as you call me jerk or idiot, we're all good. Uh, and I yeah, call me right? Dr. C, Dr. Robin. I don't care if you're having trouble with my last name, but just don't call me idiot, jerk, or <laughs> profanities or whatever. So, so. <laughs> um, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and let, let Dr. Canazera yeah. go and Sherry go and everybody. You guys are up so late. Um, I thank you all fun. so much. Um, Ross, thank Laura, you. Yeah. And the, we, I couldn't, I can't have to thank Lori because she's the one helping type all those stuff. She puts it together for me. Um, and of course, all of everybody who's putting these questions um, out because without the questions, right. you know, before we came on here, we were like, what do you want to talk about? Sometimes we have a topic. Um, we love to talk about homeopathy when, when Dr. Canazero is on, because Dr. Canazero always says, I, it, we need to talk about homeopathy. It's what she does. She's constantly falling back on homeopathy because the other isn't working. So it's what we need to talk a lot about with homeopathy to try to get more people to understand it and use it, get the results that people are getting with homeopathy and not be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. It cannot do any harm. 
Right. So, so move out of your comfort zone, uh, move out of the, um, exactly. you know, the thing that you're familiar with, move out of the familiar. Right. Um, right. 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 Say. All right. Um, All right. Lori, guys. Lori, Lori's amazing. Thank you guys so much. You guys Thank are amazing. You. And Hey, what'd you think of blossom? So cute. That's I'm, the one you weren't going to get. That's the one I was. I said, no more ill animals. No I remember animals. you're like, I don't know. I'm thinking, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. uh huh. And you're like, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, right. I, you know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I was going to be a stopover, but we fell in love with her. So, <laughs> and then I also looked at her echocardiogram report and I was like, how could I, she has to be with you. Client? Yeah. She I mean, has to be with you. Home? Yeah. Her echocardiogram report. She's only a year old, by the yeah. way. Yeah. She's where I'll she needs over to be here. And, uh, I, you know, she already has major cardiac changes mm. and she's for the most part, asymptomatic at the moment and happy, 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 happy. She's cute as hell. Oh my God. She's only 15 pounds. She's Aww. so cute. She, and sweet as can be. Well, uh, you'll see on Facebook anyway, because I usually post and she's in my lap and licking my face and adoring, <laughs> sleeping, you know, it's one of those. And I, and I bought her another mean kitty toy today. So, um, oh, awesome. She gets to have a, she really likes this one. It's got a squeaky in it. So oh, it's, awesome. it's, it's, it's the bomb. So it's I'm awesome. a nutty freaking mother buying toys for my dogs all over again. Here that's you go. That's all right. But that's, that's why we love you. Closed. I'm done. That's why I can't take the trio. Sorry. <laughs> I love okay. the trio, but the inn is really closed. Uh, really I know. Closed here. So they'll, they'll find homes. They always do. So they will. All right, guys. No, I, Dr. Kent, well, we'll talk about it later, but Roz, I, 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 it's a long story. So she's asking about if you're coming to the September thing. And I know we talked about it in the past and I know you don't like to fly. And so I'm, not, I'm not a fan of flying. So um, I, <laughs> I'm really not a fan of, I mean, I'd, I'd love to come to one of your events because it'd be like so amazing. We'll have to figure um, out how to get you there. I don't you know. know what, what you you, you, we'll, yeah, talk. we'll talk. We'll talk offline. We'll talk. We'll talk offline. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Roz, uh, hopefully you're going to go to her conference because and Roz, I think, is going to be there. Yeah. yeah. And the, the two crazy cat ladies are actually going to be communicators there. What? She, you're going to have animal communicators there. I think. I'm. We're, I'm trying. I'm trying. Part right, of it is, two names. I know, but they don't live close, and so then it's going to cost me a fortune to send them out there. That's where I'm. I don't know. I, well, one is in uh, Michigan. Yeah, I need some. I need some California. I need some like in down California. The you know that the, the last day you can't find an animal communicator in California. You might actually reach out to one of them. Maybe they know someone. Yeah, I got. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll do that. Yeah, you could do that. Do that. I right, love you. Amazing. That's Karen Dendy Smith and Julie Hirt. Yeah, I have their names. I just have to get them. for your listeners. Yeah. If anybody, oh, who sorry, I'm sorry. Out, for the nightcap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, so they're also on my website. So if you didn't get the names, you can check out my website. I added them to my website. I like oh, to support like businesses. Oh, that's good. So, um, and I'd be like delighted, you know, to add you to my website too, the spa. Yeah, yeah sure. I don't know how anybody, yeah, that would be great. Well, listen, yeah, sure. Whatever. Oh, I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a bad business person. No I just want to talk problem. about problem. You don't want to be on my website. No, I mean that would be great. I would be honored. I should say it that way. I would. Be, I'm so sorry. See, I'm such a bad business. Lori's probably behind stage going, "Are you stupid?" Yep. And I'm over here like, eh, "Okay, I don't know." I'm. I. It would be I have great. Clients all over the U.S. I'm not saying I have a ton of clients in California, but you never know. Yeah, it would be, I would be a really big state. Uh, Kind of bigger than florida but they're similar because florida is really big too and yeah. uh so i get it you know one part of california you're like oh that's like a whole nother couple states away yeah so yeah, but yeah. it doesn't matter you never know so yeah I never know i know i think consulting about nutrition anyway so don't you do that remotely or not i have been not? this i can but i have been kind of backing off a little bit from doing nutrition consults because they're um I'm, I'm focusing on this conference right now. I've got so much stuff that I'm doing that it, it kind of got a little overwhelming. And so okay. I've been, I'll still give people, you know, recommendations, but I'm not doing it as deep as I used to do it. Uh, right. It's gotten a little, a little overwhelming. So, but yeah. I still right. do recommendations, but anyway. All well, right. Guys. About the September thing. And um, yeah, we got to talk. People didn't feel obliged to stay on uh, while we're talking about, you know, like 
business or not business. Yeah. But. Well, I'm going to call you offline maybe in the next day or two because I'm yeah. my mom's here with me and I got to get her to dinner. So, um, oh my goodness. I know. Well, we don't want to be like, late for that. But it's I know. mom and dinner. Ooh. I know. I know. I know. Okay. So, all right, everybody, I am letting you go for sure this time. I know we keep going. So I, I could talk to Dr. Canizero for hours and hours. And also poor Lori. She's in the background. She has no no control over this. Well, she does really. She's got the plot. She's got all the control, actually. All the controls. And look how patient she's being. <laughs> One of these days, she's just going to cut us off. Click. Yeah. <laughs> she went, that's it. <laughs> So, all right. Uh, bless all right. You, everybody. Have bless a good you. night. I'll talk to you soon. Hearing from you. Okay. All right. Bye, Bye everybody.